It may not be immediately obvious, but we're actually at a centre of aeronautical design. Now, if the Hyperion, the tourist aircraft, is a concept still on paper, we've got proof that great minds do indeed think alike. An aircraft employing similar principles is currently being built and tested right here. This is it, folks, an amphibious aircraft called the Puffin. We uh, started off with the concept originally of a, an aircraft that people could tow behind their car and take home and put in the garage. And it had to be short takeoff and landing, it had to be very efficient, it had to have, had to have lots of room to carry people, and we produced the current design of Puffin. What we need is an aircraft that can land on very rough land. It can carry big weights, but at the same time, it has a high top speed. No existing type of aircraft could do this, so I had to reinvent the aircraft, and I have done that. I've thrown away all the structures that normally create drag and do no work. I've halved the amount of structure, I've halved the amount of drag, I've halved the cost, I've made it fly faster, and it can carry as much load as the original aircraft. Now, in the future, we'll have tapered bearings, which will mean the whole thing will self-align itself. This is the biggest breakthrough since 1927, both an aircraft and an amphibious aircraft. And so we've trebled the efficiency on water. Am I at right, Angles? We've doubled the efficiency in the air. We can make it simple, strong and robust. For the two-seater, if you can maintain a car, you can maintain the aircraft, because the engine's the most complicated part. We can send it to third world countries and they can walk into a Suzuki dealer and buy parts for the engine off the Suzuki dealer's counter. We're going to go then to four-seaters, eight-seaters and twelve-seaters. Then we'll have to reorganise because we'll be into airliner type stuff. Of course, when they're finished, we'll have a nice padded seat where I'm sitting. This aircraft is 25, 30 years ahead of its time. In 25, 30 years' time, people say, oh, yeah, perfectly normal, good aircraft. Right now, people are saying, my God, that looks funny. But the fact remains is it outperforms everything else that exists. Hypothetically, it must be said, since it hasn't flown yet. We intend to have it flying about two or three weeks from now. We've got about 75 inquiries, and we anticipate ringing them about a month from now, and people can come in and fly it, look at it, or be taken for a flight and we will then make the first batch. Well, it looks as if it floats. But will it fly? I suppose the very beginning stages, back in 1982, there was some remote possibility it might not fly, but I couldn't see why not. After all, the whole aircraft is a wing. There's just two wings. There's a front set of wings and a back set of wings. So why should it not fly? If anything, it's more likely to fly than a normal aircraft, which has got a lot of pointless structure that's doing no work. With today's float test over, what's the verdict? We're pleased with the new hull shape. It's given us a bit more buoyancy at the back end because the, um, it ended up with a C or G a bit further aft than I'd wanted. Um, but in the production versions, I see no problem with reducing the all-up weight by that at least 50 pounds. Rewi's confident they're making good progress on the Puffin. So what's next? I think what will happen is at some point, somebody overseas will see this and think, what a fantastic idea and come over here with an offer that's too good to be turned down. Clay pigeon shooting is a well-established Olympic sport, and it's big in North America. Oh! Traditionally, shooters yell pull, then someone releases the target. Until now. Now there's a new solution. The person who pushes the button is called the puller, and that person is expected to have a consistent reaction time. Uh, a, good, a good puller will, will, will push a button a, a sixth of a second, and uh, shooters expect to see their targets come on cue. The problem in practice is that, is that human reaction times vary and human attention varies, and this causes quite a lot of conflict between shooters and the, and the pullers. You didn't put your gun away, did you, Josie? So what Graham and his colleague Bruce have invented is a device that automatically fires the targets on the command pull. 
Once again, though, it's been a battle. I had major problems around the microphones. One was they tended to lose their sensitivity because the shockwave from the guns is very serious. Uh, they tended to change their sensitivity with temperature. And worst, worst of all, they were very, very susceptible to wind. And, and shooters are often out in quite high winds. Um, and it was actually a very strange suggestion from an unexpected source that, that, that suggested using these, um, these plastic horn speakers that are used on burglar alarms and so on. In fact, I, uh, my first reaction was, that's a stupid idea, but, uh, but I thought, well, let's try anything once. And he did. That's what he used, a speaker adapted to work as a microphone. And that change solved all the problems at once. Oh! They were rugged and weatherproof. They, they, they weren't uh, shell-shocked. And best still, the uh, frequency response was so bad, they didn't actually respond to wind hardly at all. So it, 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 solved, it solved the problems in one hit. The product's been so successful, they're shipping volumes to the United States. Oh! And with a market that large, of course they'd have patent protection. Or would they? We don't have any protection at all. When I first uh, looked at the project in the early 90s, the co my colleague and I took out a provisional patent then, and because we didn't go through with it, it means that we're now inel ineligible for patenting. And that's actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Um, a, because patents are very expensive um, and, and hard to protect, and sometimes a patent, patenting process will actually...